like that's been happening so it's just it's just early to know but if you pick slime spitter slug your shadow congrats <laughs> right. um so how about we start with praxis mm -hmm. uh we are going to begin with alluring ember this is a one one flying charge warp for one but with Fire, fire, time, time, influence. That t that influence requirement is clearly the bottleneck here. Yeah. Um, and now, so playing this off the top of your deck is obviously attractive, but the earliest you can do it is on like turn four or something like that. Um, in the, like the average thing, you know, like obviously there are some exceptions to this. Like you can play the Praxis Stranger. We're going to talk about the, the neutrals in a little bit uh, too, but. Um, I, I don't think that this card is really what you want to be doing in Praxis decks uh, because it's just like, it's not like you get a payoff for playing a warp card, you know, per se. Yeah. It, you know, like, I mean, yeah, you got to draw a card, but like, it's not like there's a, you know, a warp synergy that you can really um, take advantage of in draft. Right, yeah. I think this this has some, you know, constructed applications, but in, it does. in draft, I just, it's just not there for me. I don't see a deck that wants this card. Maybe if you're somehow in a stranger's deck and you know you're playing like three or four Praxis Strangers, this goes up a little bit in appeal. But even then, it's, yeah, like you said, the payoff is you get a 1-1 one, one flying charge that cantrips. Okay, I mean, that's that's fine, but the it's just really tough to, to justify that. I don't think it's doing enough. So um, mm -hmm. I'm going to give this a... a Geez, I mean, D minus. I, I think it's just. I'm, I'm gonna give it a D, but yeah, like it's just, just bad. Yeah. Um. Next card. Uh. This is a much more interesting <laughs> payoff. Yeah. Whew. Noble Fireman is a two-two for two with um fire and time influence. Now this is part of a cycle that we're gonna be talking about. Uh. Most of which are excellent. Yeah. They're all uncommon. And That's all in common. Um. Yeah. Pay five to give your units plus one plus one this turn. Uh, this is not an ultimate. This is you can just activate this as many times as you like. Um, you know, this is not one per turn like the rings, for instance. This is just as many times as you like. Um, which now, obviously, you, you you have to be in the ultra late game to activate this twice per turn. But if you do, you probably win. Um, it's pretty easy to turn this into a really terrifying card in the mid game. And like I saw a game, for instance, that you were playing where your opponent had this in play. You kind of let it live for a turn or two. And then they just kind of like tempoed out and you tax you for a billion. Yep. It's, it's a two drop that's relevant in the early game and a must answer threat in the late game. And that's what I like out of my two drops. This is a reason to be in practice. We were talking about practice swarm practice tokens. This is great in that, you don't need to be in tokens to play this, though. Um, you know, you don't have to be going wide with a bunch of little units. You can just play this in any deck that can cast it, and you'll be happy he's around. Just a really good card. Yeah, now in a Stripe Praxis deck, I think that this is like a B-plus level card. Oh, yeah. Um, this is also pretty splashable too, because it, like you're you're paying it like by like playing this really for the ability, less so than the the body. So the fact that you like are playing a you know, base Combray deck, for instance, um, and you're like splashing a few fire like a fire sigil and like a few banners, you know, you might be able to drop this on turn seven. You know, pump up your team and kill them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I. I think, you know, because it's multi-faction, you got to keep that in mind, but you're going to end up yeah. in three, four-faction decks sometimes. And again, the, the downside isn't that bad. It's it's relevant late. It's good early. I don't know. This is just, what, a, a B at least? Like, I mean, as far as a 2-2 two, two for 2 can only be rated so highly, but this one's, jeez, it's scary. Yep. I'll, I'll start with B um, for it, but uh, definitely a scary card. Mm -hmm. Champion of Impulse, up next. Um, this is a member of the Champion Cycle, which I'm sure everybody's familiar with. It is a 2-2 two, two for 3, clearly bad base stats. Um, we're in uh, practice, so it's obviously a fire time influence. And then it has two abilities of fire, fire, fire. Uh, when Champion of Impulse attacks, you get plus one power this turn. And then for a triple time influence, it gets plus two, plus two. So it becomes a four, four for three. I think this is much worse in draft than it is in constructed because getting that, that influence density is really hard. And, you know, if you're getting it to be a four, four by turn five or whatever, it's like kind of like, okay, fine. It's a four, four for five it's not like you're you know doing something busted with the additional power um i am like it's it's like a c 
to me. I mean, if you're if your main faction is time, this card is pretty good. Then, it, like, yeah, e okay, even sure. if it's not a four four until like turn five, that's fine. You're still playing a four four for three. Like, cool. But yeah, if if like this is if if you're in Skycrag and you see a champion of impulse come by and you're like, oh, I could splash it. Don't just don't. Like, it's not worth nope. playing a conditional sometimes. So, so if you're if you're in practice, you're gonna play this card at least. But yeah, you really need to get that triple time for it to be worth it. Um, or I mean, a two two for three is is clearly so unexciting and not you know great. But um, yeah, in in the right deck, it's good. But certainly not a high pick. I can agree with that. Um, next, we actually have two uh, our two common. Oh, ones yeah. uh, in this, and that is the journeyman armor. Uh, armor is up first. This is a warp two two for three uh, fire uh, time influence requirements, and a summon play a one one weapon on another one of your units. This is um, better than champion of impulse. <laughs> better than champion of least, impulse for sure. At least in draft, yeah. Yeah, better than granite. Uh, Acolyte uh, is another one from set one. This, uh, you know, if you're able to warp this out in the mid game, I'm very, very happy with it. You know, if you're warping it out in the like the late game, well, obviously uh, like uh, insane, but two two draw a card for three is um, is totally passable in that sort of scenario. Um, I'm gonna like obviously not setting the world on fire with anything like that of, of this, um, but uh, as a very, very solid role player, I'm gonna put it at a B minus. Yep, you got to be in Praxis, so so if you want to knock points off for that, you know, if you say Credit Acolyte to Classic C or C+, this is right above that, and if you're in Praxis, it's way above it. I mean, Warp is mm -hmm. awesome, and that Summon Effect is really, really nice. So, uh, yeah, awesome card. One of definitely a good incentive to move into Praxis, just like this next Indeed. card, Purify. This is a great card. Yeah. Um... So this is three cost, fast spell, fire time, influence requirements, silence a unit to deal three damage to it. This does not hit face. That doesn't matter. Um, this card is spectacular um, and is just very versatile. You'll be able to find tons of applications where you're able to blow somebody out with this in combat. You know, do use it at the end of their turn. You know, deal with a problem with some threat. Answers revenge units. This just does tons and tons of stuff. Obviously, it's only you know small to medium units that you can use to kill this with. But I just think that this is so versatile and so powerful and so efficient that I'm going to be playing this whenever I get a chance to, yeah. if I'm in practice already. It's notable we've never, in set one, we had zero uh, cards that silenced at fast speed. Uh, we, we yeah, I was going to note Marshall. that. That's important. You could do it at ambush. And um, yeah, sometimes it just, you'll just use it as a silence for, for three at fast speed. And that can be really strong. And other times you'll kill a unit. Uh, it's really good against Revenge and Entomb. Those are units that exist. Uh, um, and sometimes they'll just swing at you with a large flyer and you got to take it out of the sky and then block it with one of your tutus lying around or whatever. There's, there's, it's just so flexible, so powerful. You're going to play every one of these that you can get. And it is, it's great. Again, it can't go face. Yeah, okay. But the upside of being able to silence things is awesome. B? Yeah, this looks like a classic B to me. Yeah. Brilliant Discovery up next. This is a four cost uh, fire time card. Uh, has warp and it has draw a fire sigil and a time sigil from your deck. Um, <sighs> what do you think <laughs> with this one? Jeez. It really depends on the deck. I mean, four, four cost to draw literally just power is, is rough. That's that's rough uh, in limited. That's you know if I'm taking turn my my turn four off to not impact the board, I'm hoping to draw something that's not power. Generally, yeah, I, I, yeah. I get the the Praxis deck could go all in on warp or something, but honestly, it's not possible. Like with it half being set two and set one, like it's not you know. And and you might have Praxis decks that are power hungry, but I still don't think that means you want to play Brilliant Discovery in that deck. I think you just want to play more power in your deck or something like that so uh i'm gonna give this a i'm, I'm not gonna give it an f but i'll give it a d minus i, I just don't think i, I want to play this in draft um i think praxis is generally one going to be a bit do do something different with their four power i'm i'm giving it a d plus because it has warp sure sure i can i can see that 
Uh, so next up, Clever Stranger. This is a 2-2 two -two for four fire time influence requirement, and it has warp and strangers that you control. Have, or, or strangers have yeah, All strangers have all, all strangers. Yeah, I had, a, I had an opponent that played a Clever Stranger against me in draft, and they, they seemed to be on a stranger deck, and I was like, ooh, this could get ugly for me. And they, they warped in a stranger, and then it was my turn. And I warped in three strangers of my own. <laughs> and four strangers in my deck, gross. and they were just all in a row there. And I was like, oh, cool. <laughs> nice. Um, so, yeah, but as far as draft goes, I mean, I don't think this is a reason to draft strangers. No. But if you're in the stranger deck, this is cool. I mean, it, on its own, it's just a 2-2 two -two warp for four, which we were talking about earlier is really not exciting. You know, it's cool, but not great. But, um... Yeah, ultimately, if you're not super heavy in Strangers, this is like a, I don't know, C- minus or D- plus or something like that. I will agree with all of that. Um, it's, yeah, just definitely more of a thing that you want once you're in the Strangers deck rather than the reason to get into the Strangers deck. It does overlap, though, with the Battle Test of Stranger, which yeah. is a, a bit of a selling point. Yeah, it's, it's important to know that the best Stranger Lords are in time, so you're more likely to yeah. want clever Strangers. So, um, yeah. Diogo Mlaga. Oh, um, I think people have read this card by now. I'm going to go through it quickly. Four, fire, fire, time, influence, three, five, charge, ultimate. Pay eight to give Diogo and every, in each unit in your deck, double damage and charge. Um, if you activate this thing, I have a hard time imagining how you'll lose the game. Um, and three, five for four is totally fine. Yeah, with charge, um, yeah. I mean, it's a legend. It's, it's awesome. It's... I don't know. It might not be an A, but it's it's really, really, really awesome and good, and he's got a sweet instrument, too. <laughs> yes. Um, I'm going to give it an A-. Um, yeah, if you, you know, activate because that, you're winning it, a game pretty quick. Uh, you can also splash the time half of this. You know, you definitely want to have this in a stallish, you know, you know, like, go late kind of deck. Um, but once you all have that ultimate, that every uh, like unit the, that you draw is just hot fire. The thing fire. is, you don't even... Necessary, like you want it in every deck. If you're aggressive, it's a three five charge for four. Like, sure, yeah, know, okay. The, the, the ulti is just incredible gravy. That's delicious. Mm. Yeah. All right, let's let's move on. Oh, about that gravy. Shatter glass mage five three four five. Uh, fire just a uh, fire time influence requirement, and it is overwhelm and warp, and it has summon kill and enemy attachment. Um. I would say that Furnace Mage was a very like classic like B level card. Often trade you know was like a mini two for one. Um, hit some really problematic uh, sorts of you know cards. This is restricted to only being played in Praxis decks, but is a lot better than that. Um, so in that case, I feel like this is, um, but but not like but it still has the same core functionality. Um, pretty close to uh, an A, but I'm going to put this just at a. B plus because it's just not all the time are you going to be able to get that warp value and not all the time are you going to be able to get that attachment hate value yeah. and so the the base st you know, stats of five three for five is kind of like a C level card but yeah, just it has exactly. all of these other yeah. yeah you know it's not like we were playing Dust of Brawler all day like it was okay no no so no. I I'm gonna just go with B like I don't. I think in draft, just especially because it's a dual faction card, like it's not that far off of Furnace Mage. Like you're gonna play it about the same amount, just because you do have to be in in Praxis. And now constructed, that's a different that's a different world. But in in draft, yeah, it's awesome. It has warp, but five three overwhelms nice. It's it's doing so many different things, but still, ultimately, I think that just amounts to like a B. I just think that it's going to be able to pick off a lot of rings and stuff like that too. Like you have Argentor that has weapons, it'll do a good amount. Yeah, yeah. There's, it looks like there's more targets than we expected, at least. Talir's Choice up next. This is a spell for five with fire time influence requirements, and it has uh, two modes. All of the choices have two modes. This is a cycle, as people are aware of at this point. Deal two damage to the enemy player. Your units get plus two attack this turn, or you gain two health, play two one one explorers. Um, both modes are fine. Um, usually one of them is going to be more obviously useful than the other in a given situation. The health gain is not particularly relevant for the Praxis decks, although you could be playing some number of Life Force cards you know, anyway. Um, this is like a C-plus to me. 
yeah maybe a c plus like okay the the one mode is rally but not at fast okay that's fine like like it, it, it clearly just wants you to be in a praxis go wide deck like if you're in yeah if you're even in just in praxis like mid-range i don't know if it's even that good like i don't know if you're getting enough out of it like it's either giving you two basically relevant bodies so that hopefully you buff them later with a different spell like rally or it is rally itself <sighs> I mean, the, the modes are okay, but five is a lot. Um, but it can play a role as a, potentially a finisher, and if you can't finish, all right, it buys you time to hopefully find a way to finish later. Uh, for me, that's like a... And you have to be in Praxis? I don't know. That's that's asking a little too much for me. I'm going to give it... I'll still be a little optimistic and give it like a C-, minus, but maybe it should actually be a D plus. Uh, I'm actually gonna, yeah, I'll downgrade to see. I have a little bit more optimism for this one because I think that the rally mode is going to come up just a lot, sure. and I don't think the difference of having it at fast or at slow is that relevant. Um, sure. in a lot like, of like if you're cases. if you're in Praxis, like tokens are are you just going to play this instead of rally then? If say you have a rally or oh yeah, all day, okay. all day. Yeah, I, I can agree with that just because it is at least flexible. Um, next up, Workshop Forge, uh, four cost, one fire, one time influence. Warp, warp cards on top of your deck costs two less. Uh, um, this is a lot of implication in uh, rank, but not in draft, because you will never get the density of warp cards necessary to make this really great. Send me your screenshots. I will love to see them. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm, I'm going to give I, this a half. Yeah. Yeah. It's awesome in Constructed. I don't know if it'll ever be like completely busted in Constructed, but, but in draft, I'm going to pass. I'm going to pass right on to this next card <laughs> that's a little bit better. Uh, touch, touch the touch. Heart of the Vault is a legendary sentinel that costs six power, triple fire influence, triple time influence. you got to be deep in practice here, but it's worth it. You get a 6-6 six, six for six. Okay, you know, that's good. Not amazing, but certainly good. Has warp. All right, I love that. And summon, deal two damage to an enemy. So you can go face, you can kill a small unit, whatever you want to do. You also draw a card and reduce its cost by two. This card is absolutely insane. I've been having a blast with it and constructed it, and I have no doubt that this is an absolute bomb in draft. Like, this is a potential four for one. <laughs> Just, like, yep. actually insane. Uh, it's, I mean, it's, a it's so hard to cast, but I'm gonna, if I see this in a pack, I'm taking it. Like, are you kidding me? I mean, you're never seeing this past, like, a pack one, pick one situation. Well, I mean, you guys get, like, pack three, pick one, I guess. But um, for the most part, if you're getting a pack one, pick one, you pick it, then you know that you're heavy Paraxis, and you're going to value your Paraxis strangers, uh, strangers higher. Uh, and in that case, it's an A, it's an A+. Plus. Um, and outside of that, you can't really play it, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, ultimately, I think this is an A on balance, because it has these pretty uh, strict restrictions. But um, definitely a bomb and a half. Yeah, if you see this in a pack, you're going to take it and you're going to pray to the gods that Praxis is open in your direction. <laughs> and you're going to try and force it for longer than you should. Yeah, or you just take the shift stone and move on with your life. Yeah. Um, Sand Glass Sentinel is up next. This is a 3, 6, 4, 7. This is a common. And it has Overwhelm. And when you play a spell, Sandglass Sentinel gets plus three attack this turn. Um, this is a little bit too overcosted for, for me to really be excited yeah. about it. It's still playable, but that's just, yeah. If I, like, want a seven drop with Overwhelm as a finisher in time, I can get Dormant Sentinels, I hope. And there's a seven, yes. seven, and if I play a power, they get Overwhelm. Um, I mean, I guess if you have a ton of spells, you can kind of go off with this or something, but... This seems like no, very late pack no, filler, can. whatever, that I'm hoping to never play in my deck. This is not the payoff that the other Praxis cards are. So, um, I, I mean, at the end of the day, it's still technically playable. It's got stats or whatever, but D minus. I'm going to throw the minus in there. Deal. Moment of creation, our favorite card. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, I guess I can't this give this that... an F even though I want to. Yeah, um, number of creation, eight cost, double fire, double time. Uh, it is a spell. Play two sentinels with uh, attack and health equal to the number of spells in your void. You are never going to get to the density of spells that are necessary in order to make this to be actually good. To be actually good as an eight drop, this needs to give you two four fours consistently on turn eight. Um, yeah. You know, and yeah. I just this, in, in my opinion, is not even close to 
what you want. Although, like, I mean, sure, once again, send me your screenshots, but I think this is a D. Yeah, I'll, there will be games where motive creation is awesome. I just don't yep. know how often those will be. I don't know. In frequent? Like, like, again, the format is slower. You're in time fire. Fire is okay. Removal time is okay. Units, I guess. Like, okay, sure. But that doesn't... I don't think that makes this a bomb, so... Uh, or anything resembling that. I mean, once it makes two yep. four fours, that's okay. But still, again, they have no evasion, no anything. There's You just make a larger unit for this cost anyway, so... Ugh, yeah, let's... Uh, I'm... I still won't give it an F, but I, uh, I am. I'm gonna give it an F plus. So <laughs> I'm gonna give it an F plus. Sweet. Okay, we are now on to Ooh. the Huru cards. Yeah. Uh, we have. Uh, we're gonna start with Bring Down. This is a two cost um, Justice and Primal influence. Silence an enemy unit if it had flying. Kill it. This is a great inclusion in um, a lot of. Huru decks, it's common, so you don't want to overload on this. Like you, like I, I don't think I'm generally going to want to play two, um, but as a one of, and I, I want this as one of in every Huru deck. Oh yeah, this this is I will play more than as a one of because again, uh, yeah, it can kill flyers, but it's a fast spell with silence attached to it. Um, sometimes I'm very happy to have a desert marshal without the two one attached, and this can be that. Um, yep. And it also can kill any flyer. Doesn't matter how big. We're not, you know. I was thought, I was always happy to play, you know, a copy of Violent Gust sometimes too. This is just blows that card completely out of the water. Just oh yeah, not close. Not close. Like if you're in Huru, I I think I'd be happy to play two of these in Huru actually. And maybe the third one I'll start thinking about it. But um, it might not be the reason to move into Huru. But once you're in Huru, I'm very happy to be getting some copies of Bring Down in my deck. Yep, that sounds all fine to me. Um, I'll, I'm going to put it at a B minus because it does have that sort of restriction. But definitely, like the the first one is easily a B. Yeah, yeah, this, I, I can I can agree with that. The, if you're in Huru, you're going to be happy to get copies of Bring Down into your deck. Um, maybe not as happy as copies of this next card, Kothan the uh, Far Watcher. Yes, the legendary unseen himself. Uh, two cost. For, it's in Huru, just one Justice, one Primal, two, three Endurance. All right, that's already pretty good, you know, two, three Endurance for two. We haven't seen, like seen anything C. like that. That's, that's honestly scene. probably better than a C, but anyways, we've got an ultimate. Pay six to give Kothan flying, so he gets flying, and you play a 4-4 four, four Owl with flying. So uh, I guess he's an honorary member of that common cycle, just blowing them all out of you know the face of the planet <laughs> just like oh yeah that's yeah. cute you guys you got plus two plus two all right well i'm gonna i'm gonna make an owl and kill my opponent so this this thing is just insane it's a legend so you're probably taking it anyways for your collection or stones or whatever but yeah this is i don't know it's a two drop that's relevant in every part of the <laughs> the game it's an awesome top deck it's awesome on turn two this is this is an a uh, maybe an a plus sure who cares it's it's just um, i'm gonna give it an I'll just give it an A because it it, it does die a torch and stuff like that if you're sure. playing in the early turns. So you're not always going to get that 4-4. Four, four. Uh, obviously, I think that you want to try and play this on 8 as much as you can. Um, but that's going to be every game. But the, all of that doesn't really matter. Just take it all yeah, your time. You there'll, see it. There will never be a game other than one where you don't have any primal or justice influence. That you'll be like, ah, oh, Kothan wasn't a great draw here. Like it's just Those words will never really be said. <laughs> <laughs> also very splashable this is part of a cycle that we were seeing like with uh with yogo etc uh this one is one of the more splashable one members of that cycle sure. so that's pretty exciting mm -hmm. aerialist trainer two four for three that has primal primal justice influence and has mentor give the student plus one plus one if the student has flying draw a card um i don't think that it's going to be that hard to get the density of flyers that is necessary to make this really shine mm -hmm. and if you do um you draw a card off this you're gonna be you're feeling pretty good oh yeah um if it's just giving plus one plus one if it's just three five worth of stats on a three drop like that's good you know totally playable yeah. totally playable um so i'm gonna give this one now, you have to be dedicated Huru, because the, the influence mm -hmm. is obviously pretty strict. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to start this at a B- minus because of that. Um, yeah. But uh, definitely a the sort of thing that any a beatdown Huru deck is just going to love this. Right, it's a three-drop, as you said, the double primal justice influence. That That's a bit restrictive, but it's 
So three drop, that's you can play it as a two four blocker for three and a print pinch, or if you add a two drop, at least you get the mentor and give it plus one plus one. And late game, you'll hopefully have a flyer and you exhaust it and you draw a card and it gets big. Yeah, it's just there's not many situations where this is a bad card other than when you can't cast it. So B minus sounds fair, but honestly, if you're really in Huru, it can be even higher than that. Yep. So how about you tell us about the next card? Ooh, Island's Choice. All right. This is an uncommon fast spell. Uh, it costs three and one Primal Influence, one Justice Influence. And we get a choice here. This is a modal spell. We've already gone over the Praxis one. And I think Island has a bit better choices going on here. You can either negate an enemy spell with four costs or more, or kill an attacking enemy unit with four attack or more. So this is excellent. Um can it doesn't negate every removal spell but a lot of the removal spells in this format are expensive you know as we've mentioned um you know the fire removal spells cost five or whatever so stuff like that it can hit um but really in 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 draft you're going to be playing this more for the kill attacking enemy unit with four attack or more um that's awesome if they have like a combat trick you can actually cancel out the combat trick by killing the unit once it got buffed or you're just killing a large unit because you want to kill large units so this this card's just great um if you're in huru you're going to play every copy you can of this card um your sound kind of died on me oh. for that one so okay. we uh can you just give me back at the beginning of island's choice i think you're sounding better now okay yeah sorry that my i don't know my mic's giving me weird problems today apparently but, um, yeah, so Island's Choice gives you a couple choices here. The first one, you know, you can negate an enemy spell with four, cost four or more. So a couple expensive removal spells, whatever, something like that. If you're lucky, it hits a harsh rule, I guess. Um, but you're really playing this more in limited for the second ability, which is kill an attacking enemy with four attack or more. So it can kill any large unit, or if you block and they go to use a combat trick, you can... Let the combat trick resolve and blow them out by now killing their newly large unit and get a two for one that way. So uh, it's just an excellent card. Uh, you're, if you're in Huru, you're going to play every copy you can of this card, really. Uh, you can't use it proactively ever, but okay, sure, that's fair. Uh, it's still really good and kills large things when, when they start attacking you with it. So um, I guess that puts it at a B. I, I, I'm going to give it a B. Um, I'm pretty down on the idea that it has to be on the attacking part of it, so that just nudges it down to a B minus, sure. which isn't you know terrible, but it, it definitely will be useful in most games uh, and and uh, be very efficient at that. Uh, now we have the spell shield architect. This is a three two Aegis that has a mentor ability that gives the student Aegis. This is a common, and uh, that's a pretty sick little package for for just three. Yeah, sorry, my I figured out what's going on. My internet is dropping and reconnecting. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, all right, it looks like it's good for now, so hopefully it stays that way. Sorry, sorry. Well, let's start over here. We were on... Spell Shield Architect, yeah. Okay, so, wow, that is pretty art. Uh, Spell Shield Architect. All right, so a 3-2 for 3 with Aegis. Um, that's annoying. It'll stick, it'll block, but it's not going to do anything great. Uh, but giving certain units aegis man this this card is just annoyance incarnate um yep i've i've ran into this a few times and i've got like this handful of like alk blasts and stuff and i'm just like what the hell am i supposed to do now um I, keep in mind when playing against huru decks um if they've got a two drop in play you might want to just kill it if you can because you might not be able to kill it for long yep um uh, so um, and it's you can also let you know one of your best threats take a turn off of attacking so that it gets some proper protection for the rest of the game. Um, yeah, just a solid card. Um, I don't know if it's like the reason to be in Huru, but if you're in Huru, you're going to be pretty happy to play this card. Uh, I'm going to put this at a C plus. Yeah, um, that sounds about right. It's definitely not, you know, definitely a happy happy habit when you're in Huru, but not like drawing you in mm -hmm. master's lesson uh this is a four cost double t um justice double primal um and it has m as a spell and it's mentor draw a card for each of the students battle skills this is not a card that i'm particularly interested in because i don't see how you're able to get the density of battle skills necessary in order to make this worth it 
Yeah, I'm just going to go ahead and give this an F. You might end up in a deck where you can draw a bunch of cards off that, and cool, that's awesome, congrats. But yeah, this is just a rare that's... Uh, you know, if, if you get two cards off this, that's okay, but you're exhausting one of your units and you had to jump through how many hoops to even get there. Yeah, I'm, I'm not interested. I'm, I'm giving this an F. You might do fun things with it constructed, or you'll do something really cool with it in a draft once in a while, but I'm not drafting it highly ever. Nope, nope. Uh, next we have the Shelter Wing Rider. Mm. This is an 04 flyer uh, with Aegis for four and double justice, double primal. Um, but it also has a sweet ability of Shelter Wing Rider gets plus five attack when she has Aegis. This means that it's functionally a 5 4 flyer for four when it first comes into the, the battlefield. Um, that's pretty scary. Yeah. Um, and you can very easily take over games. This is very similar to something like Impending Doom um, in a lot of situations. Yes, it can have its, you know, Aegis pinged by whatever, and that's going to suck. But um, very much the kind of card that I'm happy to play um, as a uh, top-end sort of uh, finisher. or well, not even top-end, yeah, but like it was just four. a solid... It, it's cost four. Yeah. 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 The influence um, requirements are a little tight. Double justice, double primal. But if I if I see this in my opening pack, uh, it's going to take a lot for me to not take this despite how restrictive it is. Uh, even if they pop the Aegis, it's still an 0-4 flyer. Like you can sit around and block. And then there are ways to give it Aegis. We did just talk about Spell Shield Architect and um, even something like Protect or whatever. Yep. And can get it back online, or if you teleport it back to your hand, that'll refresh the Aegis or silly things like that. But uh, if they if they don't have anything for it, it's still it's just gonna win you the game. It's a five four flyer, so yeah, just yep. just excellent um, upside, not really any terrible downside. Yeah, I'm gonna start this at a B plus. Personally, it does have some mm -hmm. important downsides, and definitely the Aegis proccing you know effects. Um, are going to go up in your in your ranking like protect and the spell shield architect um, to try and protect it and, and allow you to keep on uh, battling with it if it uh, does get um, popped. Yep, sounds good. But fine. Um, next we have shield bash. This is four costs for a spell, one primal, one justice. Stun an enemy unit, gain two armor, draw a card. Oh, dirtily little thing, you know, like it doesn't really, like it's just kind of air at the end of the day. But, you know, relieve a little bit of pressure you know maybe set up a a weapon on the next turn um allow you to get in some damage process of uh, troubles and blocker seems fine but at the same time none of these things are exceptional that it's doing yeah it's it's classic filler if i need something to take the place of you know and if depending on what my curve looks like like i don't want to play a 19th or 18th power this can get in over that and you know sometimes you care about the stun effect or whatever or the armor like it's doing a bunch of little things that you might care about but ultimately not a ton so i'm just gonna give this a d i, I try i officially played this and i was more impressed with it than that like i don't yeah. think that is it's it, is it like dispel-esque actually like i mean yeah i think it's closer to that i think it's closer to that okay level. um you know, maybe like I, I have to play with it more. I have to get the feeling, the, the format more. But I was I was happy with having it as a one of in my in my deck. It definitely had some application. So I'm gonna put it. Uh, C sounds a bit high, but yeah, C minus seems fine. All right, I'll move it up to D plus. Champion of Order uh, is up next. This is a card that is really more for constructed, and even there, I'm not as enthusiastic about it as others. This is a two two for five. Um, with one primal, one justice. Hopefully it would have a really sweet abilities to make up for it. Their abilities are sweet, but they have problems. Uh, for five justice, you get at the start of your turn, double champion of orders, attack and health. Mm -hmm. And for five primal at the start of your turn, play a copy of champion of order. So this basically means that if you get all the influence requirements, you're able to totally take over the game. But how are you ever doing that? In, in draft. You gotta really drag and, it out. <laughs> geez. And then it has to survive, it has like no silence, nothing. This is the, like, this is just too narrow for me. I, I'm just gonna put this straight as an F. Um, yeah. You know, because just two, two for five is just too embarrassing. Yeah, at least with Champion of Cunning, if you ever did hit the influence requirements, you had a, like, if you didn't hit the influence requirements, you had a five, five for five. So it was like, there was no downside to putting it in your deck. Champion of Order can win you the game by itself, but man, you... 
you've got to really have a bunch of Huru strangers already or something and then hold up protect. Like now you're sounding like a constructed deck to me, not a draft yep. deck. Um, yep. So yeah, I'll give it a D, but man, if, if you see this in a pack and you've already got say two or three Huru strangers, grab it and enjoy your occasional free win. <laughs> That'll be sweet. Yeah. Duelist Blade is up next. This is one that I'm actually like very happy about having. This is a 4-4 four, four, uh, Relic Weapon for 5, uh, 1 Justice, 1 Primal, and it has Summon You Gained Aegis. Uh, that means that your weapon is protected, your face is protected, and you get a 4-4 four, four weapon too. Yeah. 4-4 four, four weapon for 5 is great. Yeah, this is excellent. Yeah. Um, geez. Uh, B? Is this? Yeah, is... B sounds about right. Like, I mean, it's just, you know, a solid weapon. The incidental Aegis is never something you're going to turn down. Yeah. Yeah, and even if you're, like, you're an Argentport Weapons, this isn't too hard to splash, and you'd be, like, pretty True. happy to just throw that in there or whatever. It's just, it can deal with Aegis units, and as we see, Huru's got a lot of them. And uh, it can be a win con, too, on certain port states. Who knows? Yeah, yeah no, it's, man. Just a, it's just a good card. Pretty wild to see this in Huru, but uh, super sweet. Yep. Uh, next is a card that I am looking forward to playing. And if this format is as slow as you kind of saying that you feel like it is right now, yeah. this is a card that is going to do some work. This is cycle a cycle continues. Th yes, uh, this is part of that same cycle. This is a six cost, one primal, one justice card, one five flyer. So it's a tower top patrol for two more, which is is pretty rough. But the the ability on this is great. Pay five to draw a card. Um, you basically need to be in some sort of dedicated Huru control deck for this to be a key part of your game plan. But if you're able to get into a board stall, if you're able to drag out the game, this is just going to take over with card advantage. Yeah, I don't think you need to be in a dedicated control deck. I think you just throw this in any Huru deck or whatever and play it. And if it shows up, congrats, now you are a control deck that's going to win the game. <laughs> like, I don't know. The, the downside of just a 1, 5, or 6, eh, it's there, but the upside is you just bury your opponent. Just completely bury them. Like, in in uh, in my experience, the format's been slow enough. You're not going to have too much trouble slowing it down enough to play this card. And yeah, once you untap, if you don't have anything to do, you just start drawing cards. And eventually, you'll draw enough cards that you have ten power. So you start drawing two cards, and the game's over. Like you just you just won. Um, yep. So yeah, this this card is awesome. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm gonna give this one a, I think a. Like, it doesn't win the game on its own, technically. Like, it's not going to be the thing that really kills your opponent. But, I don't know. I'm still going to give it, like, a B here. Like, this card's awesome. Maybe, I, maybe it's gonna, even better than that. I wouldn't be shocked. I'm going to try and control myself and give it a B- minus because it is something that the failsafe of Tower Top Patrol for f 6 is really not exciting to me. Um, but, uh, definitely, I will be picking it higher than that. Um, Meditative Stranger. Up next... Four, four for six and it is one primal one justice as you would expect and it has strangers have aegis i'm looking forward to playing this to just see how all the mechanics of it work in some respects because one of the things is if you play this and then you play a second one does this give your units aegis again if they've just been popped previously yeah. when you play but i'm guessing that when you play this like all of your a strangers get an, uh, a bubble immediately. Yeah, my understanding is you play this and your strangers gain Aegis, but if the Meditative Stranger dies, they all lose the Aegis. Um, okay, that's what I've sure. heard for how it plays. I haven't tested it myself, but this is what I've been told, and I'm going to trust it for now. So, But again, it has it's a 4-4 four, four for 6 with Aegis, so it's kind of hard to kill, and it immediately gives all your other strangers Aegis. Is that worth playing in draft though eh, I, I don't know about that uh, four four aegis for six isn't the most exciting thing in the world but i've played a four four aegis for five but that also gained me armor and stuff i don't know but uh if you're deep in strangers this card seems really awesome <laughs> that's for oh sure. yeah but i don't know See, i don't think it's a reason to go deep into strangers yeah, I think we've identified like the idea like there are those cards that you pick to get into strangers and there are those cards that you pick once you're in strangers. This is one of the ones that's in the the second category. Great when you're already there, but I just don't think that the failed case of 6x six, six, um uh, 6 power 44 four, 
Aegis is good enough for you to be playing it in it. And then also the fact that you can give your opponents uh, strangers Aegis, that would really matter. That that hurts. Yeah, that, that can definitely be annoying. But again, it's not making their strangers any larger or more threatening. So sure. the downside's not that bad. Like we talked about with like the Endurance one or whatever. It's not it's not that big of a downside. It's something you can tolerate. They're just two twos with Aegis. Okay. D plus? Uh, I'll still give it a C minus. I, I think a 4-4 four, sure. four Aegis for 6 at least gets that. Oh, wee! Now we have a legend, the Nostrix Lord of Visions. This is a six cost, triple justice, triple primal, five seven flyer. That right there is already an ultra bomb. And it has a mentor ability of give the student and each copy in your hand and deck plus three plus three. If you play this, I have a hard time seeing how you lose the game because it's eight, ten worth of stats, five, seven of which is flying. And if you're able to hit something that you already have another copy in your hand, gr great, you did it. You won it all. You're you're a master. Um, this is just like, uh, if you can cast this, if it, you're deep into it, like you pick this back one, pick one, and you try and draft around it to go ultra deep into Huru. And if you pick this and pick one, pack three then you know you're you're doing it if you're in huru too yeah this card's awesome take it it's a bomb <laughs> there we go uh huru uh eight of the huru up next a 12 cost card yeah uh yeah double justice double primal and has the ability stun each enemy unit play two four four owls and with flying draw two cards gain four armor I don't see how you lose the uh, game if you cast this, but I also don't see how you cast this. Yeah, 12 is a ton. It's just so yeah. much more than 11, 10, 9, 8. Like, it's just so much more. It's just yep. really, really hard to get to. Like, the average, even if the average draft deck plays 18 power, <laughs> okay, you have to draw all but six of your power. That's, you know, two thirds of the power in your deck. Oh my God. Wild. So, um, yeah, I. I Sadly, I, I don't want to give this an F, but I, I have to. You should not draft this card. I will draft this at some point and do stupid things, but you should not draft this. Agreed. Now we are on to the Argentport cards. We have, are going to start off with the Auroch Bully. This is a 3-2 two for 2 that has plus 1, plus 1 when wielding a weapon. Once again, the weapon has to be on this card, not on anything else. Um, I like. I mean, this is pretty close to just Argentport Soldier for me, for the most part. The, the plus 1, plus 1 when you're holding a weapon, like, it's fine, but I don't feel like the Argentport deck is you know, super beatdown. Ah, uh, but it, I mean, if you have enough of these, it certainly could be. This is at common, so they're trying to make this the common sure. payoff. And if you're in Argentport, a 3 2 for 2. Yeah, as you said, like Argentport Soldier wasn't super exciting, but that plus 1 plus 1 adds up once it also gets a weapon. It becomes pretty large. But yeah, this, I don't think this is a reason to move into Argentport, that's for sure. But if you're in Argentport and you care about weapons, which I guess you're supposed to, this is a good card. Again, a I've had a lot of experience with Argentport, so I kind of agree with you that largely not very exciting. C plus? Yeah, we'll go C plus. Uh, it might end up being even just a C, but we'll, we'll see where, where the, the deck ends up. Tell you the next card is one you're familiar with. Oh, yeah, this is my spoiler card, Auric Vigilante. It's a rare Gunslinger Minotaur, uh, and it's a two-cost... In Argentport, just a Justice and a Shadow. And it's a 1-1 one, one for 2. Not great. Um, has Revenge. All right. Makes it a little better. But when Auric Vigilante attacks, she gets plus 1 attack. So the first time you attack with her, she becomes a 2-1. And if they block it with a 2-2, two, two, she dies. She goes in your deck. She'll come back as a 2-1. And then hopefully you attack again. She's a 3-1. And hopefully she trades again with something. That's, that's what you hope for. Is that the average case scenario? I don't know about that. And also what happens when you top deck this in the mid to late game? It's not exactly, you know, I like my two drops to be relevant in all stages of the match. And I don't think Org Vigilante passes that part of the test. Uh, it can possibly take over a game, though, if you play it on turn two. And I do like two drops that could do that. But I don't think this is quite on the level of even something like Blade Can Apprentice, which 
while I enjoyed and played a lot, that was a fire card that was naturally aggressive and had a lot of other things going for it, like Quick Draw. This, While Revenge is good in a lot of cases better than Quick Draw, I don't know if it is for the case of uh, Draft. What do you rate it? Uh, after all that, I I mean, still, if we're comparing it to, you know, Org Bully, which we gave a C plus, I'd say it's at least on that level, so... Let's just go with C plus. I don't. I don't, I don't want to put this in the B range, though. Maybe I'm. I'm uh, it, though. I I am much colder on this than you are. I think this is closer to a C minus. Sure. Okay. I, I can buy that, but I, I guess at least Orc Bully can block in the mid game when you when you draw. But I, I think the upside at least kind of is there. Okay. Now we have a legend. This is Bartholo the Seducer. This is. Yeah, this sounds like a lot of fun and interactive eternal happening right here. It is three costs for double and uh, double justice one shadow influence two two unblockable ages and ultimate uh, pay ten to draw a relic of your choice uh, from your deck. That ultimate not super important. Sure, you can get a weapon of some description from it, which is fine, and you're going to have some of those in your deck probably if you are an Argent Port. Not the important part of the card. The important part of the card is that it's these just annoying AF, and if you put anything on it in terms of weapons or you know buffs, it's going to drive your opponent mad. They are forced to find two ways to interact with this um, to both proc the um, uh, the Aegis and then kill it. Otherwise, they are just going to die to Bart. Yeah, I'm just grateful it's in. It's a legendary, so it's not going to show up often, and also it's hard to cast, so it's not going to show up often, so you don't have to worry about being like stuck in super uninteractive games where this shows up and you can't kill it right away and it gets weapons and you you feel dumb. Um, that being said, uh, you know, you do have to be an Argent Port, but Argent Port cares about putting weapons on units, and this is an unblockable Aegis unit. Hard to find a better target for weapons other than maybe a flying lifesteal Aegis unit, but... Uh, yeah, if you're an Argent Port, this is great. If you're not, it's not great. But if you see this in the start of your pack, and you, it's a legend that's probably going to see constructive play, so it doesn't matter what grade I give it. Um, sure. But I'll give it, I don't know, the, the upside's crazy and the downside is still just a 2-2 two, two unblockable Aegis. Let's let's go with B. I don't know. I, I hope to never see it both ways in draft, though. I'm going to put this up to to B plus. I'll have yeah, to feel it out to get a sense of exactly kind how of a unbeatable it is. In a way, but not really. Yeah. 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 Uh, next, Bloodletter. This is a rare weapon uh, that's a 3 2 weapon um, for 3 and has summoned the wielder gains lifesteal this turn. So this gives you a nice little dose of of life. Um, since this doesn't really fit into the uh, life force sticks because those are dedicated. Uh, Zenon, although I guess you could splash this, um, but that's not super exciting because you kind of want the consistency of it. But anyway, um, this is a weapon that you can have and it is going to um, be good in a number of situations. 3-2 weapon for 3, not exactly stellar, but the fact that it gives you that big burst of life will really turn around a lot of races. So I would put this as being lower than something like uh, the Lethry Felshin, but that was a really solid card. Yeah, and I don't even know if it's that much lower than Lethrite Falchion just because the weapon stats are so good. But uh, Lethrite Falchion was incredible. This card also seems good. Like, even just that one burst of life will be huge. The fact that it costs three means, like, if you have a two drop, like Auric Bully, and you just put this on it, it is now a seven five or something like that. It's insane. Yeah. On turn three, seven five, lifesteal for one turn, and then it's still a seven five going forward. Like, this is going to give you some stupid busted curves for sure. Um, so does that make it like this first pickable draft bomb? Not sure about that, but it certainly seems powerful. Uh, what grade would you give it? Uh, boy, this is... Weapons are always so hard to, to, yep, to they really are. Like, evaluate. Like, Do I want to take this over, say, like, like we're comparing it to other like, removal at common? Is is this like something I'm ever taking over, like even extract? Uh, I'm a little skeptical about that until I really see it in action. So, and it's a two faction card. Uh, I'm gonna go with B minus. I'm gonna be optimistic on it, but that that might still be too high. B minus, I think, is where I would put it. Um, next, we have Slay. This is three cost, one primal. No, no, one justice, one one, yeah. one shadow. No primal, no primal. It's an argument. 
It's an Archibor card. Kill a unit and it's for slow speed. Uh, this is like a textbook B plus almost. Or, or do you think this is like a, it goes into the A category, just extremely uh, efficient and unconditional removal? Uh, because it's dual faction, I think we, I don't think I can just move a removal spell into A range just because it's like, no. sometimes you have to splash it or something like that. But it's still a very high pick, like B plus seems fine or B whatever. It's very very splashable too. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, it is splashable at least. That that is the nice thing here, and it's really hard to find unconditional removal in this format. So, yeah, yeah, that sounds all good. Pretty pretty straightforward card. Um, Champion of Vengeance is up next. This is a four cost one, justice one, uh, shadow card three three. Um, if you have four justice, you, it is invulnerable to damage during your turn, and if it has four shadow when Champion of Vengeance attacks, she gets plus two attack. Um, as we said with the, some of the other champions, those influence requirements are very steep, which makes me a little bit cooler on this card. Um, three, three for four is a pretty bad fails state, but not terrible. Yeah. Ultimately, this is like... A C, I guess, because it just kind of has like, like if it was a three, three, four, four, that's like a D plus, and then if you had either of these online, it's yeah, you know, it, it's pretty decent. Um, so I don't know. Let's put it as a C as kind of an average of the two. Yeah, she can definitely take over the game though. There's there's no doubt about it, if, especially if you yeah. hit that you know if you hit both influence requirements. But that's not trivial. I can agree there. So no. C C seems reasonable. Maybe bump it up to C plus. It, like if you're definitely in a two faction deck, I don't know. But um, yeah, scary card. But can you ever get to that scariness? Is a different question entirely. At least at least the downside is just a three three for four. So. All right, yeah, C seems fine. Tell me about the next card. Sanguine Sword. It's a common relic weapon. It costs four. It's just a justice and shadow influence. And it's a 2-2 weapon, but on summon, you may sacrifice a unit to give Sanguine Sword plus two plus two. So I guess on boards where you have a 2-2 that's like irrelevant or something like that, you can sacrifice it to turn this into a 4-4 weapon and kill a few of their units, hopefully. I don't know. I have I have trouble picturing really where I what decks want to play this card or or anything like that. Um, a two two weapon for four is certainly not exciting, especially in a format where I know I can get two two relic weapons for two in the same faction. Yep. So you really want that upside and flexibility, and maybe that is worth a second faction and two more power. I am. Um, for now going to remain skeptical of that though and how about you um i mean the way that i'm thinking about this is like you know in a smuggler stash deck that has okay. some dark wisps yeah. like like i'm thinking about some like really exotic thing to make it really sing but for them the, like the base case is pretty unexciting right. which makes me want to say that it's a c minus yeah like like i love ravenous thornby so that's because it's Worst case scenario yeah. was a three three for three, which was totally cool. And then its upside yeah. was it just became a five five for three, which was insane. This is like the the upfront is borderline unacceptable, and the upside could be really good, but it doesn't feel like I'm really cheating that hard on it. Um, you said C minus, I can maybe buy that, but I'm I'm gonna go with D plus for now and, uh, as a wait and see. Stone Powder Alchemist is up next. This is a card that we did discuss before. It has um, Life Steal and Revenge. It's a 2-2 two, two, um, for 4. And it says Summon, deal 2 damage to the enemy player. That means that you also gain the life because it has the Life Steal attached to it. Um, this is a really annoying card for aggressive decks to true th through. But if the format is sort of defined by dirtily time decks where the body doesn't really matter, I'm much less excited about this card than my first reading of it. Yeah. Um, like It's a card that's doing a lot of good useful things but at the at the end of the day it's just a super pushed role player right it's never going to be the feature in any game of like man this card's insane yeah sometimes it'll be a lifesteal unit that you buff up with weapons and that's cool but eh, you've got other options for that anyways it's a two faction card it's still a two two for four i think at the end of the day while it's doing a lot of cool stuff and it's useful that still only puts it at like a c plus um yeah um i would put it at c 
a um, okay. little bit less on, on it than than you are. Um, but uh, like, I, I, it's playable, but uh, just oh, yeah. kind of flat. Up next, we have another member of the cycle of the pay five um, units. This is a one four for four um, for Argent Board Influence, and it has Endurance and Unblockable. Uh, and it has the ability pay five to get two armor. That ability, unless you have some way to really take advantage of it, feels pretty meh. Um, it's like kind of a functional gain to life. If you had that other um, justice card that that liked that, that seems kind of interesting, but not like then you're playing one bad card plus playing a five to get it really to go off. That seems like a weird contraption to put together. The body of a one four unblockable for four is kind of what I'm the most interested in about this. Yeah, it wears weapons like a champ. So mm-hmm. in that respect, I think that it's it's a fine card. It's just that that ability I find is just like I don't. Yeah, yeah, I guess maybe there's some games that this is you you have a good weapon you know, and you're able to you know, activate this every turn and you know, mow down your opponent's units. But usually I'm just gonna be like you know I'm just gonna slap a weapon on this and only use activate that ability if I have literally nothing else to do. Right. Yeah. There's a few cards we saw already that care about gaining armor and you can get relic weapons on it. I think this this is definitely a card that's appears okay at first glance but might end up being way better than the sum of its parts just because it's doing so many little different things that argent port really does want to do that that you end up it ends up being almost irreplaceable in the deck as you said it wears weapons really well and the gaining armor part while not great it's better than not having that ability and occasionally it'll actually be an insanely powerful ability with the right relic weapon setup or whatever um so I don't know where that ultimately ends up putting this. Like, is this strong enough that when you see this, you're like, oh, time to move into Argentport? Or is it more, oh, I'm in Argentport already, and great, I got a Streetwise Informant. I'm super happy to have this card. I, like, that. that's, like, which side of the line does this fall on? And I I don't know yet. Um, I'm going to start by being optimistic and saying this is a B-, minus, but uh, it may not end up that way. See, the more that I'm going through this review, the more that I'm just kind of feeling like the Argent Port is just a weird faction, and there's all these like slightly different things going on. Yeah, it's, it's, and in order for uh, as I said going into this, it's hard to figure it out. I haven't figured out Argent Port yet, so I'm like trying yeah. to be optimistic with it, but and have faith in the developers that they're better at designing a draft format than I am at figuring it out right away. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to start this at C plus because um, but uh, part and part of that is motivated by the fact that I'm. I don't get it. Yeah. Um, but uh, it, I, it is definitely playable if you can cast it. Bereaved Stranger, 4-4, four, 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 5. Then Strangers have Lifesteal. 4-4, oh, four, yeah. four, Lifesteal for 5 would see play in any deck that could cast it. Um, that would be a B quality card, I think, or B+. Plus. Um, you know, you know, at uh, base. If you have uh, Density of Strangers, this goes up. Um, I don't know why Argent Port is really playing Strangers because it's not really the it doesn't make as much sense in it. Um, but it's just as a four four uh, life steal for five. I'm pretty happy to be playing yeah. this uh, and all my decks. Yeah, it's a four four life steal for five, so it wears weapons well or whatever. Yeah. Uh, the downside of maybe giving your opponent Strangers life steal tolerable, not the end of the world. Again, they're not at least getting bigger. And um, yeah, just just a good card. Um, I'm cool with giving it a B. B sounds about right. Um, next, we have a very powerful card that uh, is going to have lots of interesting applications in uh, Ranked. I'm interested to explore that. But just for our purposes here, five. so this is Inquisitor Macto. A. Five plus. A plus. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm just going to read it through. It's an A plus. Um, double Justice, Double Shadow, uh, Flying Revenge, and Macto's Revenge never ends. This means that if you're able to get the game to stall out you're just going to get Macto back again and again and again and you're going to kill your opponent with a 5-5 flyer that would have been a bb plus if it just was revenge and didn't have the other thing so this is a ultra bomb play in all your origin pork decks yeah Roland's Choice. This is the the um origin port installation in this cycle it is a five cost origin port influence and the two options this is a slow one by the way oh yeah uh, one, give one of your units plus three plus three, not until end of turn, just permanently, um, or 
uh, enemy units get minus one, minus one. This seems pretty solid in draft. Yep. Uh, really flexible. Uh, if Plague is good, you get Plague, and Plague has been a blowout so often in my life that I'm never going to really underestimate it. Maybe there's less X1s and stuff lying around, but still, Plague is great. And uh, if, if you're in a spot where Plague isn't great, you get the biggest unit on the board by buffing it up. So I uh, I really like this card. Uh, I think this is a great reason to be an Argent port. Uh, if you have multiples of this, you're even happier. Um, I don't know if that quite puts it to B, but I, I think it does just because of the flexibility. Like, I just like how flexible this card is. It's really never going to be that bad. I mean, I think that if you get the plus three, plus three on a revenge card, that's going to have the potential to kind of really define a game. Um you know, it's it like it's kind of a gem blade in in a lot of uh, respects. In the, on the one half, and then plague in the other, and both of those were totally respectable cards. So for yeah, so for me, I'm I'm gonna rate it as a as a B. Yeah, it's it's easy to underrate the the flexibility of it. Like yeah, it's not as good as is plague or whatever, but and it's in two factions, but but the upside is is massive, and it's never really that bad. Uh, tell me about the next one. Valkyrie Denouncer is a common Valkyrie that costs five. Uh, in Argentport. And it's a 3-3 three, three flying. Alright, that's already fine. And it has revenge. Woo -hoo -hoo. So if that fragile flyer gets killed, whether in combat or by a removal spell, it'll come back again eventually. And it has mm -hmm. all the other cool upsides of revenge. So uh, this seems like one of the big payoff cards for being in Argentport. Doesn't care about weapons, doesn't care about whatever. It's just going to be a great card. Yeah, no, it seems great uh, in a lot of situations. Um, like, I, you know, we said Huru Fledgling, roughly a C-level card. Revenge is a really good add to that type of card. So I'm going to say it's a B-, minus personally. Yeah. Um, I, you can't go crazy. It's a 3-3 fire for 5, so it's not going to take over a game by itself. But um, but definitely, if you're able to get this back through Revenge, you'll be, you feel pretty good about yourself. Yeah, we'll start on B-, minus. maybe as we play with Revenge more in Limited, we'll see how powerful it really is and it goes up in value but i think b minus is a good place to start grinva is up next she is the judge of battles and she has triple yes, justice please. triple <laughs> shadow requirements she is a seven nine for seven and it has an ability that says when one of your other units is killed grinva deals that unit's attack in damage to the enemy player um this is really really hard to beat once it's onto the battlefield yeah. and um i just i mean just seven nine for seven uh, like out of base is really enticing and um it's just going to warp the game uh, around it and i it's going to be really hard for your opponent to win if this is able to be played seven is a lot yep um but it feels like some of the Argent board decks are going to be kind of grindy revenge thing going on in which case you're going to be pretty happy to have this kind of uh, card as a finisher yeah there's things you can nitpick like as far as giving it an a or a plus or a minus because it doesn't have flying itself so it can't block other flyers and it doesn't have evasion itself but again its ability is pseudo evasion in a way it's just insane if you see it in a pack you're gonna take it and hopefully you can cast it that's that's the big big if there with the triple justice triple shadow seven cost but yeah this thing's awesome if you if you open it just take it and have fun <laughs> i'll put it at a minus yeah Sounds about right. Uh, that is it for Argent Port. Still weird and confusing even after going through that, but we have Skycrag, which I think is pretty easy to understand relative to Argent Port. Yeti we have, Flyers. What else do you want? Yeah. Bash and face with Yeti goodness. We have Champion of Fury to begin with. Uh, with this uh, with this theme, and it is a two two for two, um, Skycrack influence, and it has a plus one attack and charge if you have double fire, and plus one attack and overwhelm if you have a uh, double primal. Um, this is just a really efficient beater. Obviously, it's not going to take over the game or anything like that. But to, to me, it's like the kind of the classic um, like B B plus sort of range of just hyper efficient duder. Yeah, I mean it's a two two for two with wild upside, like. Just, yep. just if you draw it even in the mid to late game, it's a four-two charge overwhelm. That's that's awesome. So you know, it might not. It there may have you know be a five-five on the board and it can't quite attack, but still, what more can you expect out of a two-drop? So no, yeah, I'm I'm pretty excited to see this in a pack and take it and try and make Skycrag aggro work. Uh, I'll go out on a limb to do that. 
Sweet. Now we have Caleb's choice, the last of the member of the uh, choice cycle. This is – oh, no, we have one more. Of course, we have uh, Xenon in next. Um, yeah. But this gives us the ability to negate an enemy spell with single faction or kill an enemy attachment with a single faction. Mm. I th- I think I'm happy to run one of these in all of my uh, Skycry decks, although there's obviously diminishing returns. I feel like you're going to find a target of one of these types in almost every matchup. Yep, yeah. I don't think I'm going to go out of my way to like pick it. Again, I'm not going to like move into Skycrag deliberately for Caleb's choice. But if I'm in Skycrag, yeah, I- I'll-, I'll play this over Backlash for sure. Mm-hmm. And puts it at like C plus for me? Sure, that sounds about right. Ooh, rock slide up next go for it yeah rock slide is an uncommon fast spell in sky Craig. still just costs two and this also has some choices to it it's not a caleb's choice but it might be better um you can deal two damage to an enemy or deal one damage to two enemies and keep in mind this is a fast spell so you can do some silly things in combat with it or stuff like that um it can always just go face if you want if you have plus spell power somehow in play and you choose the other option then it's like both both halves of it are getting uh extra spell power it's just flexible powerful removal it's just this is just excellent uh yeah it's not going to kill a large thing but even then you can uh, again it's fast you can up trade a unit or whatever it's just it's so flexible i I, it's hard to nitpick this thing yeah um how would you rate it I think still at the end of the day, I can only rate it as high as like a B minus just because it's not killing everything, you know, obviously, yeah. but just in terms of flexibility and for its cost at two and efficiency, it's just great. I think, yeah, B minus sounds solid, but also another mode on it that I really like is deal, you know, pick off their, their one drop or their two drop or whatever, deal one to their face, and that enables spark. Sure. Is a, is yeah. a useful yeah. ability. Yeah, I mean, maybe just because of flexibility, I can even bump it to a B or a B plus or whatever. It's just, it's just awesome. Yep. Um, we have Clan Hero up next. This is a common 3-3 three, three for three. Um, Skycrag influence, spark, play a two attack iron sword on Clan Hero. So this is a... 3-3 three, three for 3 as a base level, but then it can become a 5-3 for 3. For three. Um, both of those, yeah, you know, it's a pretty narrow band you know, in terms of like ceiling versus floor, both of which are totally acceptable. Um, you know, not like something to you know high-five your, your neighbor about, um, but um, definitely a very solid inclusion in any Skycrag aggro deck. Yeah, if you're in Skycrag, you're happy to have this. If you're, you know, dominating the skies and that's how you're getting spark, then this comes down as a 5-3 and can trade with anything on the ground that's going to try and hit you back so and if you don't need any defense on the ground it's going to hit them really hard just just really nice you know above average i I suppose filler slash role player if you want to call it that so is it still just a c plus i I don't think this is getting into the b range yeah i think c plus is is where i would put it too double faction spell all right yep uh another card this card does not get into the b range it gets all the way to the a range oh, okay. in my opinion yeah i can see um, you got uh a minus for vadius clan father this is a three two quick draw aegis for three fire fire justice in uh primal um influence and this has the ultimate ability of play seven to get a steel thing chakram on vadius this is to me, kind of in the same category as Bart of being you know, really frustrating to deal with. Um, when you have this as part of a Sky, Sky Crag aggro deck, it's just a really, really powerful um, you know, turn on the uh, on the curve. And the the fact that you get a real card out of it at the once you ultimate it that, that comes back and that you can use again later is to me the real selling point that puts it over the top to to an A minus. Um, sure. You know, Chakram is just a, like, it's, it was a pretty good card. And the fact that it draws you that is, uh, is something that I'm, I really like. Yep. Yeah. There's, there's going to be situations where maybe it's not a great card. So you might question why are we giving it an A or an A minus? Cause it's not maybe by definition a bomb, you know, there it doesn't play defense great or swing your board state in certain situations. But if you're in Skycrag aggro, this is going to be like the best card in your deck. Like if you see this in a pack with Slay, you're not going to take Slay. You're going to take Vadius. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I, I can agree there. He's just, he's good in the mid game and in the late game, you 
just have this unblockable monstrosity that if they somehow answer, you still get the chakram out of it. It's it, Yeah, yep. this is awesome. It's just, you know, it, you have to be in Skycrag. You have to have the double fire. That's okay, sure. But once you meet those requirements, this card is going to be the best card in your deck. Yep. Uh, next up is a card that you should never play. This is a Calderon Cradle. Four cost. Um, we're probably all familiar with this for those who played the uh, corresponding um, event. Um, Skycrack Influence for every five spells. You play play a 5-5 five, five Dragon with Flying. Most A lot of decks don't even have five spells. This is totally unplayable. Um, just just yeah. enough. Classic F rare relic. I think we've seen a few of those in Primal already, and this can join its friends in that club. Hunter's Harpoon up next. It is a four cost one one weapon, a little bit on the lower side than what you need like. Gives quick draw, really useful ability, and then it has when the wielder hits the enemy player draw a card. Um if you put this on a flyer it's going to be really difficult for a lot of players to to fight back. If you put this on basically anything, it's going to be difficult. Like this card is awesome. This is this is the uncommon reason to move into Skycrag. Like this this is it. I love this card. I like attacking, I like drawing cards, and this helps me do both. Um yeah. I'm I'm going to give this a B. I it's, I think this is just excellent. Yeah, I think so too. And it's just the, like the idea for me that there's going to be a lot of games in which it's you know three drop flyer, which there's a lot of, mm -hmm. and into into this. And if your opponent doesn't have a blocker for it, this just takes over the game, and uh, and that's all that uh, all she wrote. And if they do have a blocker, uh, it might just die, and then they still have to fight. Yeah, no, answer. exactly. I mean, you're giving it plus one plus one in quick draws. Nice. Yeah, it's this yeah. Is great. Yeah, um, really at, at its best in the aggressive decks, of course. Mm -hmm. um, but it's going to be great uh, everywhere. Mo Mortar, another card that is going to be great everywhere. It is a four-cost um, primal uh, fire influence fast spell that just deals four damage. So this is Torch Plus. Uh, costs a lot more, but um, I think that four damage matters. Yeah, yeah. I think we've seen four damage start to matter Actually, a bit more in this set, especially like when you look at time and we saw that it's four drops, there was a four, 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 and a one, four, five, four, four, like those kind of things stood out as far as like four mattering. We saw a lot of two fours in this format. So that one extra point of damage is going to go a long way. And plus, it can go face. It's not like this is only removal for units, it can be reached for the face. Just really, really flexible. Yeah, four is a little on the expensive side, but it's going to get the job done. You're going to play as many copies as you can of this card in your deck. Um, it's really a question of do I want to give it a B or a B minus? Uh, I'll, I'll go with B. Uh, I'll go with B minus a bit to begin with, but um, definitely one that uh, I will be happy to play as many of these as they give me mm -hmm. in the my average guy Craig deck. Storm Glider is up next. This is a four cost two two flyer. Um, part of this cycle, of course, that we were talking about earlier that um, has the. Five um, ability and has a flying and overwhelm and had pay five to give storm glider plus three attack this turn this one is less exciting than some of the others this is probably the worst of the cycle um two two flyer for four is fine um the overwhelm i guess is to enable spark but the fact that it doesn't really generate a lasting impact on the board in some respects um i find to be a uh, kind of frustrating so if you have the skies clear yeah this is going to kill your opponent really fast um but the fact that like you need to have that requirement makes it um much less exciting for me yeah like putting overwhelm on flying is just weird it's like it already has yep. evasion now it has more I, I get it it's like supposed to be cute as a spark enabler but but i agree um but again in the late game if the skies are clear or there's not much in the way this activate ability is going to get in for some chip damage as a finisher um, but certainly not a premier finisher. Um, but if you're in Skycrag, I think you're always going to play this card. So uh, just if, especially if you're aggressive, it gives you something to do with your power in the late game. Um, I don't know. I think that that puts it at C plus for me, I think. Like a, a 2-2 flyer for 4 is what? A C minus? So uh, I don't know. The overwhelm plus the, the faction. Yeah, I, I'm going to go with C plus on it. Sounds about right to me. Towering Stranger up next. This is a big boy. Oh, yeah. uh, this is a 7-7 seven, seven, uh, for 6. Um, this is one that, like, 
I would just play a 7-7 seven, seven for 6 in draft. That's massive. Oh, yeah, that's great. And it's got a little more going for it than just that. So it's a stranger that gives other, your um, strangers overwhelm. Yeah. And it's, so that means it has overwhelm itself. Oh, yeah. So 7-7 seven, seven overwhelm for 6, I definitely play. Slamming that down. I am taking this yeah. every time if I open up a pack. Oh, my God, this is beautiful. But it, it also the thing is that it doesn't really have the downside of other strangers because giving your opponent two two strangers like overall I'm like yeah sure who cares yep. you have a seven seven so so is this like B plus territory or is it like, I mean it's a large evasive unit for six yeah 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 in yeah and that, yeah let's just go with 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 B plus this is really interesting um, not like a stranger in the sense of the usually most are thought of, but just to think of this as a seven, seven overwhelm for six. And I think that it's, we, it's really, really solid. We were freaking out about a seven, five overwhelm for six. Now, of course that was yeah, mono yeah. faction and warp, but I mean, yeah, this is, I'll, I'll give up warp to get two extra health for sure. All day. Mm-hmm. Knuckle bones is oh. up next. This is oh, a relic. Man. Slam That's- it. <laughs> uh, this is a mean tacular card. Uh, seven cost, a relic, and it gives uh, summon. Transform each card in your deck into a random card at the start of your turn. Draw an additional card. That is really wild. Yeah, I have no idea if this is an F or an A. <laughs> I mean, once you get to seven, you'd start to draw two cards a turn. Do you care what's in your deck at that point? I don't think so. Yeah, I mean, you could get a bunch of, like, pilfers and power, but you could also get, like, just anything. I don't know. <laughs> this this thing's wild. It's a seven power do nothing until it, and then it just starts drawing you an extra card every turn. I don't know. This is, not, this is wild. I have, I have no idea. If the format's as flow, slow as I think it is, I mean, Skycrag doesn't, it seems like it wants to be aggressive, but if you end up in a non-aggressive Skycrag deck, like, I don't know. Are you, are you first picking this ever? Can you? I mean, I, I'm first picking morbid this. Morbid curiosity. Yeah, yeah, outside of morbid curiosity, I mean, like, I have no idea. Yeah, I mean, I'm also going to first pick it, but I don't know if that means we should. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm. I'm actually tempted to say that this could be pretty strong, especially if you're splashing it in some other archetype that you know, like the dedicated sky, sky crag looks so aggro, so it doesn't really fit there. But if you're splashing it in some other control deck, like an Elysian deck that's splashing some torches on this, like. Pfft, yeah. I, I don't see how you lose when you have this in play. The real dream is when you play your Knuckle Bones, you then transform one of the cards in your deck, ideally the next one you draw into another Knuckle Bones. So you play <laughs> that, and then you start drawing two extra cards a turn. And the cards in your deck are double transformed? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, uh, I, love it. I don't know. Uh, I'm going to say this uh, is too great to even receive a grade. <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna give this a it exists B+. in a plane where grades don't exist <laughs> topaz drake up next for three flying charge for seven and sky Craig influence um seems like a decent top end if you aren't in controlling sky Craig deck there aren't going to be a ton of those on the balance i think that's probably about a c yeah, if you need a finisher in Skycrag aggro or something and you want to go up to 7 power, this this will do it in a pinch. But again, not a reason to go into Skycrag, but if you're in Skycrag, you can pick these up late and they'll play a role in your deck if you need them to. So yeah, like C- minus sounds good. I think it's a good splash card too for, for some archetypes. Sure, sure. That, I, I can see that as well. Yeah, totally splashable in the right deck. Molot and N- Nokova less splashable. Next. Less splashable. Yeah, less splashable. Oh, uh, this is an eight-eight flyer for eight triple fire triple primal influence flying Aegis spark deal four damage to each enemy that includes your opponent's face and uh, everything. Um, I have a hard time imagining casting this in draft and losing the game because you can just even suicide your board. It doesn't matter if you deal one damage you're going to wipe out your opponent's board and have a 8-8 flyer yeah this is a uh, slam dunk first pick try and be in sky crag if you see this card yep that sounds roughly correct it's really hard to beat if you're able to cast it but obviously you have to build around it uh a minus for me mm-hmm. decimate ah uh, this one's less i'm excited about um this is a 10 cost double fire double primal uh deal 10 decimate can't be negated or blocked by aegis this i think this is supposed to be like a finisher in a control deck in ranked getting up to 10 10 is just too much for me yeah yeah i don't mind doing cat 
spending eight to get a you know an eight eight flying aegis with like potentially wipe out your entire board 10 damage while awesome it, it costs 10 it just costs 10 that's just a little too much for something that's not even really guaranteed to like end the game sometimes it might just end up being like a removal spell <laughs> so yeah no. you know it, it only ends the game if your opponent's really at 10 so while, while it is a lot of reach i mean for 10 costs no i'm, I'm gonna have to pass on that f <sighs> I mean, D minus. I'll, I'll give it a little bit there, but yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, not great. Uh, that is it for Sky Craig. We are off to our final set of cards. Ooh. We are on to Xenon. We have the Blister Sting Wasp to begin with. This is a 1-3 for 2, uh, flying and deadly. Oh, this yeah. This is a great little role player, right? Like, you just trade with anything. Sign me up. B minus? B minus sounds. Well, I mean, it's definitely a B, yeah. but uh, definitely, um, yeah. B minus seems uh, outright in the sense that it's a good defensive, you know, uh, element. Um, just as kind of very solid role player in in a deck, and um, not something in the life gain um, synergies, but it works. Yeah, it's just a two drop that again relevant early game, relevant late game. It's just always good. Yeah. Give me away for the next one. Blood Call Invocation. It's a common spell in Xenon. It costs two time shadow. And it's life force. It's a life force spell. It does nothing else unless you've gained life this turn. And it says, play a Restless Radiant with attack and health equal to the life you gain this turn. So uh, if you gain zero life, this does nothing. If you've gained eight life this turn, it makes an 8-8 eight eight for two. Um, this is, I guess, technically a Life Force payoff card, but it is not a reason to move into Xenon. And if you're in Xenon Life Force and you end up having enough enablers, you can play this card and, um, you know, it might give you a momentum swing somewhere in the mid to late game, but it's really hard to, for this. You're never casting this on turn two. And, you know, I think best case scenario is you're casting this maybe on turn four when you've got a, like a life steal unit down on three or something like that. And it's making hopefully... A 3-3, three, three, but it's just so conditional. It can do nothing so often. Um, yeah, it's just I'm not a huge fan of this. But it can make the cut occasionally if you're really, really hard into life force. So, um, I don't know, D+, plus, I guess. Uh, obviously, it's like an F outside of life force decks. But in if you have enough enablers, it starts to go up in value. And even then, it's still not amazing. Yeah, I'm going to start this at, as a D plus or so. Um, it's just there's so often it's just literally two power, do nothing. Yeah. So that's that's a big problem. Ayan is not a do nothing. <laughs> this is a three cost, one time, double shadow, lifesteal ambush, three, three, with an ultimate, pay nine to silence a unit in your void, then play it with plus three, plus three. Um, this is just totally a blowout in a lot of situations. It's very hard for your opponents to play around it, so you're often going to eat just a two, one, or a two, three, or something like that on turn three. Um, that's just as, as its baseline. You gain life, so it obviously fits into the life steal decks, and then the ultimate giving you an extra card in draft. And you know, especially if it's a you know, like doesn't matter what it is, it's you know, three three or a four four. You're getting a six six or a seven seven. Um, this is just you know, if you can cast it, this is you. You always pick it. Yeah, I, I guess it's like an A minus maybe or something like that. But if it's in the pack, you're gonna take it. It's just it's yep. awesome. It's a legend. It slices. It dices. It does everything. It's just. There is no point in the game where Ion is really a bad card. Um, yeah, I'm gonna put it at A minus two, just because the body itself doesn't take over the game. Yeah. Um, but uh, the ability might. I know this next card is a good friend of yours. Yeah, speaking of taking over the game, we've got an uncommon dinosaur here in Shadowlands Bone Picker. Three cost, uh, just Xenon influence requirement for a three three. So three three for three, nice. And uh, it's part of the pay five cycle. This this has a mm -hmm. activate ability that costs five. If you pay five, you give your Shadowlands Bone Picker plus two plus one. This is not plus two plus one for the turn. No. Nope. This is plus two plus one permanently. It becomes a five four, then it becomes a seven five, and then a nine six, and then an eleven eight, and it just or eleven seven. Whatever the hell math works. It's been a long <laughs> podcast. It just keeps growing. I have. Had games where I've just made this into a 25 attack unit, gave it unblockable, and killed them. 
and I've had games where my opponent did that to me. It wasn't like some rare occurrence. Like, Xenon can stall out the board, gain life, do whatever. And again, the downside is you're playing a 3 3 for 3. The upside is yeah. the, it just is the largest unit on the board, and you win. And it's just insane. Yep, I think that puts it in a B plus because this is just really solid in basically any Xenon deck. Yeah, it's it's never bad. It's only weakness, I guess, is that you could die to flyers in the meantime or something, and it doesn't have evasion. Okay, those are things you can fix for for what it's doing up front. Yep. Aura's choice Ooh. is the next. This is a spell that gives uh, that two choices of silence an enemy unit and put it in the owner's hand, or silence a unit in the enemy's. A player's hand, then they discard it. I think that this is a pretty reasonable package, and it's a you know reasonable cost as well. Um, I think that usually you're going to want to try to use it for that second mode to discard a card, um, because that has that that's pretty uh, useful in a lot of a lot of cases. Kind of like a you know slightly worse um, treachery um, effect, but the fact that this also has some applications in the light game um, to balance a problematic flyer, whatever. Um, and silence at the meantime, so that even when it comes back down again, it's not causing you as many problems. I think this is a pretty great package. Um, obviously, you can't you can run too many of this kind of effect, uh, so it's only something like a B minus or a C plus. But I think that every Xenon deck wants one of these if they can get their hands on it. Yeah, I've been pretty pleased with this card. I've played it now in multiple decks, and every time I've casted it, felt really good. It just felt good. It can either impact the board if you needed to impact the board, or it can, if the game's slow and they're holding onto a bomb, it takes out the bomb or whatever. I think this format is kind of more bomb uh, dominated than than the old format. Like if if we're talking Prince versus Popper, this feels a little more Prince of a format than a Popper format. Um, and this just gets better then. And again, you Xenon can sometimes struggle with flyers or whatever. You can never really have too many silence effects. If you're against a unit putting, or a deck putting a bunch of weapons on a unit, bounces it, you know, because of teleport, whatever. It's just really, really flexible and fairly costed for its effect. It's just, it's a very good card. Uh, yeah, B minus. Banish is one time one shadow for power fast spell kill an enemy unit or relic with cost four or less this is just a great removal spell still doesn't hit quite everything that you want um so that makes it i think a b plus for me but you know just efficient removal is efficient removal yeah in this format there is going to be a few more more expensive units like people are going to be playing five six seven eight drops but still kills everything four or less and the fact that it's got the flexibility of killing relics really really nice so, um, you say B plus? Uh, uh, sure. Yeah, B plus seems fair. Ooh. This next one is not a B plus. This is just straight up A. Yeah. Um, if not, you know, if not even higher. So this is Catra the Devoted. I know that you've had a chance to play against this card. <laughs> yeah, I've lost to it like every time I've seen it. This card's <laughs> insane. I think one time I got to silence it and kill it, but by then they'd already like given their team plus three, plus three or something like in that turn. But yeah, it's uh, Catra is a rare. It's a cultist. Uh, it's a three, three for four with double time, double shadow influence. This is, this is asking a lot out of you. And it also has life force, uh, but the life force line makes it all worth it. When you gain life, your units get plus one, plus one. This, there's no limit to how many times this can happen in a turn or anything like that. It's just every time you gain life, your units are getting bigger. Um, if, if you build your deck right and if Xenon Life Force is open, there's going to be games where you cast Catra on turn four, untap, and your the game is over. Like Your, your entire board just explodes in size. Uh, and even in the late game, like yeah, it's just a complete and utter insane bomb. Just this card is yep. nuts. Um, yeah, just take everything, everything with any life force or life gain, uh, you know, synergy with it, and your deck will just be great. Yeah. So easy A for and, Catra. And if you somehow don't end up with a ton of life force and neighbors, it's a 3-3 three, three for 4 that still has to be answered at some point, and you're, you could still just win the game. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's true. Excellent card. Xenon Augury up next. Mm -hmm. uh, this is... For cost, for a spell, Xenon influence, draw one of the top three cards of your deck, put the rest on the bottom, you gain three. So this is kind of like a overcosted scheme. You also get a little life force, you know, you know tie in there. Mm -hmm. uh, 
overall, I think that this this card is just a little bit clunky for my liking. Uh, I've played this now in every Xenon deck I've drafted, and it's been much better than Scheme. The three life gain really does matter in Xenon. Sure, okay, um, yeah. But that being yeah. said, it's not a card you're going to go out of your way of. You're going to get this late in packs if you're in Xenon and no one else is. So that still puts it at like a C-. minus. It's not like you want more than one of this. It is important to know, though, that because of the way the Life Force deck works, you need to both find your payoff card and your enablers, so digging through your deck is more important and you have more time to do it because you're just incidentally gaining life all over the place so um yeah it's it's a card that you know in any other faction combination or any other draft format i think would be terrible but in this deck it's kind of just doing everything you want to be doing other than you know actually being a payoff card in itself um yeah but you'll be you'll be happy to play one or maybe even two copies of this in a in a xenon life force deck but you're not going to go out of your way to pick this ever so like the first one's like a C then, you think? Yeah, like... Or, or high? Yeah, a C. Again, you already have to know you're in Xenon to take this, so... Sure. So once you are, you, you kind of know, and if you're not, you're not even looking at this card. Xenon Cupbearer is up next. This is a 2-4 Lifesteal for 4, and Xenon Influence, a little bit understated, but the fact that you get a Life... Um, Steel life force, uh, you know, tie in obviously, uh, pretty nice, um, little, little pickup mm -hmm. there. Um, I think that this is like kind of like a standard C to me, of just you know, it, it, it does maybe it's a little bit higher, C plus, yeah. Maybe. I think, I don't know, I think C plus is about right. Um, you know, it's, it's not as strong as some of these other multi faction payoff cards, but it's a reliable source of life gain. And you know, if you're in Xenon, you care about life gain, but again, you can't value the enablers as much as the payoff cards because this is in the same packs as the payoff cards so you kind of have to take those over cup air as nice of an enabler as you might think he is so um yeah c plus sounds about right there blood call invoker is up next this is a three five four five with um xena influence requirements and as the life force clause of at this end of your turn play a restless radiant with uh, attack and health equal to the health you gained this turn. This is a really powerful card if you do get the, yeah. the uh, good, cohesive life force deck, because you're going to be able to you know, pretty easily get you know, at least at least a 1-1 one -one per turn, but often higher than that. Yeah, this is a card that you are, that it's a risk to speculate on early, but the payoff is definitely there. Um, like, there, again, you could pick this, and then if you end up like not in Xenon, it's you know it's not like some card that you can just splash in a Combray deck or something and you hope it's good, you know. Unlike if you pick a multi-faction flyer or something like that early in the draft. But if you end up in Xenon Life Force, this will be the best card in your deck unless you end up with like a Catra or something like that. It can just if you really are going off, you know, anytime you cast a Spirit Drain, you get a four four in addition to killing a unit and stuff like yeah. that. Like, yeah, I've I've drafted this once. I first picked it i think or second picked it and i ended up in the life force deck and it was absolutely bonkers the, the card was just so good um b minus uh or b yeah i'm gonna go with b just because the upside's so insane but yeah b minus is fine too mask of torment uh this one is not insane five <laughs> cost uh time and shadow influence plus one maximum power and it has life force when you gain life you get plus one maximum power and that has the ultimate of play 25 to play the tormentor i don't think that's going to come up in very many games i have to imagine this is like like what was the one like amaranin explorer the three three that gives you a power mm -hmm. that, that this yeah. I, I feel like that's just better than this card I actually played against this in a draft. <laughs> yeah. And um they did they, they did they torment you? No, but they were they were getting close. I ended up dying because they gave their bone picker unblockable or something. <laughs> um, but they ended up getting to like there was like three or four cards left in their deck and they ended up getting to like 22 power. But that's because they found an <laughs> amethyst ring like with seven cards left in their deck or something, and that's when it started to threaten. I, I don't know. I'm, as much as I love the Life Force deck, I'm not going to pick this early and say this is the payoff. It's a five-cost card that does nothing until you gain a ton of life, and then you do get an 8-8 flying charge, um, but that's that's a lot of work with no immediate payoff. It takes a long time to get that payoff, so uh, 
I'll still I'm just gonna give it an F. Uh, maybe you'll get past it later and you can play it in your life force deck. But a five cost card that not only doesn't have any immediate impact, but takes forever to get that impact and you have to like gain more life, that's just so much work. I don't know. I don't I don't like this at all. So this is to me the um, classic get uh, F grade, send me your screenshots type of uh, yeah, card. Yeah, you'll lose to this card at some point in draft and be like, okay, fair enough. <laughs> Champion of Mystery is up next. Ooh. This is a six cost seven seven for Shadow and Time. Um, that, as a space, as we were talking earlier about the um, that Stranger card, is like pretty playable. Mm -hmm. um, the the rest of the text we'll talk about it in a bit. But what would you rate as a seven seven for six? Um, that's already like what a C plus. Like it has it has no evasion or anything like that. But it's just a really large unit for six. Like yeah, probably at least a C plus. Um, so the abilities on this, because they're so taxing, I don't think are going to come up and are very important in this. Um, so it is six time when Champion of Mystery hits the enemy player, draw a card. And when it has six shadow, it is unblockable. So when you have those enabled, that's absolutely insane. Mm -hmm. But um, that's just not going to come up in most games. So I'm going to be rating this as just exactly a C+. Plus. This is a 7-7 seven, seven for six. Um, I'm going to rate it a bit higher just because I've played a lot with Xenon already and I know Xenon can just stall out the game very long and this can just be your finisher. Um, you might not get six in both, but if you get six in one or the other, you're just really well set. Um, like a seven, seven unblockable for six is ending the game and a seven, seven that you have to block every turn. I mean, you kind of already have to anyways, cause it's a seven, seven. So I, I get it, but, um, yeah, I'm going to rate this as like. Not much higher than you. Like, it's still just a probably a B minus or something just because it's so hard to hit those influences. But it's it's spooky. Spooky now. Prophetic Stranger is the Xenon Stranger at rare. This is Strangers get plus three plus three. And it's a three three in itself, but it costs seven. Um, this feels... I, do you think that this is something that the Strangers deck wants? That they think they'll be able to get up to seven consistently? Obviously, if you play this in a Strangers deck, you're going to win the game if, you, if you're able to play it. Do you think that you're able to get up to seven influence most often? Yeah, I think so. It's not like Strangers are going to be naturally aggressive or anything like that. Um, it's really a question of, like, are you going to first pick this and force Strangers? Uh, uh, it depends on what else is in the pack, right? That's why we're grading here. But, um... It is nice that unlike the other Stranger Lords, you know, that we've seen Determined Stranger or whatever, its base body's not a 2-2, so at least if your opponent has a Stranger, it's still <laughs> bigger than those. Like, so its downside's not quite as bad, but it's still turning them into 5-5s. Five um, but it's also turning yours into 5-5s, five and there's a lot of Strangers that you can grab in this set. So, yeah, that's that's interesting. It, it itself is a 6-6 six, six for 7. That's really not that bad. Uh, it's not great. I want a lot more out of something that costs seven um this is a tricky one to evaluate I, I don't know if it's if you take this if you just know strangers will always be open or or what or if you should wait and see but yeah this is this is tricky i'm gonna give it a a b minus just kind of hedge like if you are in the strangers deck it's just the most insane card ever but it does cost seven and if you're not it's fail case isn't awful it's just not great I'm going to put this at a C plus. Sure. That's, um, that's yeah, I could be wrong. It's going to even be lower than that, but I don't know. Yeah. This is, I, I could see it end up uh, being like a D at the end of the day. I yeah. Know. Our last factioned card yeah. is the World Joiner, which is a nine cost, triple time, triple shadow card. Uh, eight, eight, when World Joiner attacks each up, uh, enemy unit gets minus one minus one and she gains that much attack and health oh yeah um this this is clearly a card that if you're able to attack with it once you probably win uh it's really hard to do that so this is a build around um for those reasons yeah you, you, know, you have to... like xenon ramp or something like yep. that but um if you see this pack one pick one it's i think it's worth speculating on this this card's pretty wild if you uh, nine is really expensive though so yeah you know and then you have to draw it and you have to cast it you know there's a lot of ifs 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 this is probably not an a but i also in this format i don't think it's an f i think in the last format like just set one draft this was an f 
uh, especially because mm-hmm. it's a Zenith card. Um, but just say, like, ignore the influence. It was a nine cost. Like, you just couldn't play nine cost cards really that much. In this format, I think it's much more doable to actually get to nine cost in the right deck. Uh, still tough, though. That's not, not an easy thing to do. But but if you start off the draft with this, it's good. Now, if you open it in pack three, that's a different story. But grades don't matter as much there anyway. If you're in Zenith, you're still going to try and play it. So, um, <laughs> I man, I mean, it's an A when it's in play, but getting it in play is part of the 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 uh, thing. Like it's it's an F or an A depending on if it's in play or not, right? Yeah, I, I don't know what to do here. Uh, I would say just take it and try and make it work. But if, <laughs> I'll almost say you know if there's I'll a slay in the pack and you feel like being responsible, go ahead and take the slay. I guess I'll just punt and call it a build round and just say that that's a real answer. Sure. To what it's supposed to be. Right. <laughs> right. Um. Okay, so we are going to quickly go through um, just uh, the faction strangers and then the banners. So let's start with the banners. There, there is, um, there's, there's, I think, one or two other cards that aren't the... Ba- the yeah, yeah so there's we'll, one, and we'll talk about that in oh, a bit. There's actually two. Um, there are two. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yes, you're right. Two, two, yep. two. Uh, so let's start with the, um, the range of banners. Whereabouts are you taking those right now? Boy, yeah, that's been difficult. Um... Like, I thought maybe I would have to value fixing higher, but it seems like I'm still getting it kind of decently late. Um, just because the density is relatively higher uh, in in this set, right? This set's about half the size, or not, not, it's a bit bigger than half the size of set one. But there's still five banners and five strangers, so you see them slightly more often. Um, mm-hmm. And, I mean, it's just, if I'm trying to build synergistic decks or whatever... I really need to focus on getting my playable count up. Uh, I found when I, if I started to value fixing a little too high, it actually made it a bit tough to get the right playable count sometimes. And I was starting to play worse cards, and I'm like, well, why am I even playing fixing at this point? So mm. I, I haven't quite figured out where the sweet spot is for when to take banners. Like, uh, are they C? Are they C plus? Are they B minus? Are they C minus? I haven't figured that out yet. Um, <gasps> I realize that's a I'm gonna... out, but I think I'm going to start at C, exactly C. But I... I'm going to say that too. I think that it is something that you do feel the slight increase in the net amount of fixing. You are going to be multi-faction more often than in set one, but uh, I think that as a whole it sort of balances out. So I'm, I'm liking C as a place to begin with. Um, then we have this the cycle of strangers, um, before we probably had, like, did we have them at a C plus before? Mm-hmm. Um, um, I think two drops are less important in this format, but if you are playing two drops, a lot of them are going to end up being strangers. So I kind of then put it squarely at C as well, yeah. because you just, you know, like it's great fixing, makes your deck more consistent, does a lot of things that, that you like. Uh, the strangers deck is obviously an interesting thing we still have to explore more of, um, but two twos for two are never going to be breaking past um, the C kind of range unless they have some outrageous ability. Yeah, yeah, C or C plus still. I, I think like the the fixing's nice and and it's it's, it's kind of tough to get some good two drops depending on what deck you're in. I don't know certain s- certain parts of the stranger cycle might end up being better than the others. I'm just not sure yet. Like I could see yeah. Argent Port Stranger being a little worse, but, but I don't know which one might be better, Hulu or something. Who knows. Yeah, definitely um, some of them that are associated with particularly powerful bombs. Like one of the ones I would say is like the Praxis Stranger. If you have something like Heart of the Vault in your deck, you should up its um, its its pick order, yeah. obviously. But that's like kind of a that's fairly narrow subsection. That's stuff, sure. Yeah. We have two neutral cards. We have Reunite as the first one. This is a two-cost neutral, no influence requirements necessary. Draw a stranger of your choice from your deck, and it's a spell. Um, This is very clearly something that you only want once you are in the stranger's deck and you have some of the more obnoxious strangers. I'm thinking about something like the... Uh, the battle-tested stranger um, or the fortunate stranger from set one is another great one to have with this. Um, not something you want in your average deck, but once you are already into a dedicated stranger's deck, um, I'm going to be picking at this at something like a B level. Yeah, if you're in strangers, this is a B, but you have to know you're in strangers, so you're probably never picking this pack one or very late in pack one. Um, and then in pack three, you'll hopefully know by then. 
But yeah, if you're not in Strangers, it's an F. And if you're in Strangers, it's it's really good. Don't don't pick it over yeah. a Strangers payoff card, obviously. But uh, good I card. would I would say it as if you have one high quality stranger in your deck, you this is not playable. If you have two or more high quality strangers, this is kind of like a B. Sure. All right. Sure. One more card. Read it for me. I've already passed this twice in drafts. <laughs> Spirit of Resistance. It's a legend. It's a mob. Uh, it costs 12, and it's a 10-10. It's a 10-10 for 12. And it says, Summon, yes. kill all other units and attachments. Spirit of Resistance can't, be, can't leave the void. So it's a 10-10. You summon it. Everything in play other than Spirit of Resistance dies. Even their relics, their relic weapons, whatever. Also, your relics and relic weapons and units. It's just... A 10 10 and whatever you and your opponent have in their hand yeah but it costs 12. yeah this this definitely costs 12. yeah yeah <sighs> this has got to be enough right yeah like i said i've i've opened it twice and passed it twice um so that that i've got to be i've got to stick with my word uh the format's slow but 12 is insane 12 is, just, 12 is insane. 12 is just insane. I mean, if you do get to 12, you probably win the game. Uh, it seems like a very reasonable thing to think. It's hard to remove a 10-10. So, um, but it doesn't even guarantee you that. Like, I think 8 of the Huru does a better job of guaranteeing you win the game than this does on 12. But mm, I don't know. I'd, I'd rather have two 4-4 flyers and stun their board uh, and draw cards. Sure. Um, but, I mean, it's a... yeah, I mean, we're nitpicking here. That was an F, and I think this is also a win. An F, unless you're feeling, you know, bold. If you're feeling lucky, this is a, this is a uh, a good place to to place that. But um, definitely not a card that I'm excited to play. Okay, we did it. <laughs> what day is it? Did I miss Game of Thrones? No, uh, no, not yet. Okay. Um, yeah, we, we are going to go pass out and do other things because this has been a marathon affair. Yeah, I'm going to go but stream the turtle. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Um, no, we thank you so much for joining us for this. Uh, it, it, sitting through the entire thing, whether it was in podcast form, YouTube form, or stream form. Um, you've all been great. Um, I can't believe we did the whole thing. That we <laughs> that we'll never do that again. <laughs> never? Oh, I will. No, I don't Any, know. Anytime don't know. you want, I'm down. <laughs> Let me know. Well, um, if the next set, good time. a large set, not a small. Yeah, we might have to separate the commons <laughs> and uncommons again and do that. Do probably, it that way. But probably. This was fun. You know, it was fun. A crazy it was a lot, but it was fun. Yes, uh, indeed. But anyway, that will be everything for today. Uh, be sure to check out my construction set review. Be sure to check out Ryan's stream. You know about all of that. Yeah. I'm going to go do other things uh, and uh, hope that my wife doesn't try and kill me. <laughs> and uh, everybody enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Yeah, digital, digital card games are serious business. And uh, if you're not listening to this on a Sunday, enjoy whatever day it is. Yes. Yeah. Indeed. Right. Okay. See you around. Bye, I guess. <laughs> yeah.